What's up, everybody? It's your boy, Ian, and I am here today to do it, to put my ego out on the line and answer the big question of literature. Who is the greatest living author? And I think there is only one, you know, I think one stands far above the pack, one author. But we are going to get to that answer, first of all, through setting an objective system of standardization and then applying that system of standardization to a group of the generally thought best living authors. And I am a lover of the history of literature and literature in general. And on my Goodreads accounts, I have a Goodreads account. I have over 450 books under the tag that I've read under the tag of literary fiction and they are living authors. I modified this over the past week and I looked down the list. I thought of everyone I could. I looked at all the online lists and I feel like once again, that there is only, there is one that rises above everyone else. And anyone who I hadn't read yet, anyone on a list, I would go check out some of the work and read a couple pages, read what people thought. And you know, honestly, people, you know, a lot of these people were absolute garbage. Hi, and so let's let's hop into the system of standardization so I don't, you know, so you guys can get on the same page as me. So, first of all, this author must transcend, uh, tran they transcend style, genre, time, and horizontal limitations. So let's break those down one by one. Style. They, and most of the time, if we're looking at really good authors, they are a stepping stone. They are like, you know, they are standing on the shoulder shoulders of other great authors that came before them that influenced them but they made a quantum leap from those authors especially in the last you know 60 years with modern society and they've made a quantum leap above that author maybe they're a, a falkyrian or a blakian whoever and they have taken that style to the next level and they've also made it their own their writing style just their objective writing style is unique and is separates them from the rest of the pack, separates them from every other author. You could read a story by them and not know it was them, um, and, and you would know it was them, right? If their page was, uh, their name wasn't on it. Or you'd be like, why is this, uh, why is this person writing like this, this author? Genre, most of the best authors transcend genre. They're not just a science fiction author. They are not just a literary fiction or Western author. They transcend all of it because their ability to, across their whole catalog, write really great works. They can't really be pinpointed into a certain style or genre because they have totally transcended that, which isn't that hard with the amount of verse. If you put enough work into a book, if you, you know, l care for and love your work and edit it and revise it and spend a, and you know have a ton of life experiences and read and write a lot, you could create a unique piece of art. That's pretty easy, right? You can create a whole new style and genre, especially with something like literary fiction where you have 600 pages of text to expand to make that flow. You know, when someone, when an artist does a canvas piece, they only have the, the canvas, but 600 pages of writing is a long time. And you know, how many words is that? That's a ton of space to create your own genre and your own style. But a lot of people fail at this. A lot of these authors that we're going to be looking at on the list are comparable to a lot of other, you know, a lot of other authors. They maybe are a little bit better. They have a unique style, but their style isn't their own. They are still stuck in genres. They still could be categorized. Time. So they transcend their current time period. So a good author is way ahead of their time or way behind their time. They are tapped into something that isn't, that is outside of them, outside of their society. And that's what horizontal limitations means when someone has a horizontal limitation it's that it's when they are looking just around them and they're looking at everyone else around them who is writing and saying how can i be better than them what are they doing but someone who is thinking vertically they are thinking of and this also is a metaphor they are thinking in the conscious and the unconscious light and dark as a lot of authors i mean even someone like a Margaret, Margaret Atwood, right? Who I think is a very great author. Who's probably in the top 25 greatest living authors for sure. Maybe top 10, maybe top five for some people. A Margaret Atwood, I feel like has trouble with vertical thinking at times, you know, even she who, you know, in books like Oryx and Crake and the Handmaid's Tale, there's a ton of vertical thinking in there. But if you actually think about the origins of those stories, this, you know, these two dystopian novels, they're actually just re reactions to what's happening around her, um, you know, with abortion or, and men's rights group, men's rights groups and environmental disasters. 
a good author can transcend all of that. And then that enables them to tap into symbolic, metaphorical, and subconscious connections in their writing. A good author can make, and without effort, just because they are writing from a place of flow and they're, they can tap into, you know, the creative ether, their work is almost automatically symbolic, metaphorical, and has an aspect of the subconscious within it. And they are such good revisers though, that they can expand that, that probably in their first draft or one of their first drafts, they could, you know, they get some of these symbols down, but then in the revision stages, they help expand that and connect that, connect these threads. And sometimes these threads can connect through their whole body of work. A good author, I feel has these threads almost connecting through their whole, through a whole, their whole body of work. Why is this important? Why is all the, you know, why, why, why isn't this important though? Writing or, or, and reading is we are tapping in to the mind into people, you know, unlike a movie, you can, books are the only medium where you can see what is happening through written, the written word, what's happening in somebody's mind. And that's such a crazy concept because if you are going to allow someone in your mind, what are you going to give them? I want to give people something beautiful, something eternal, something timeless. But when you get caught in the rut of trying to push a worldview or show us a, about a certain cause, and that's what your main, that's what your main focus is. Your main, that's as high as you get on the scale, you know, of, or as far as you can see horizontally about what's happening in the world right now, instead of the internal levels that you can access, then that work is not going to hold up. Works like that, if you look, even read back 100 years, are garbage. The works that are in the canon of you know the 20th century canon are works that, at least the early 20th century canon, are works that tap in to that subconscious. That's why Rilke is a much better poet now and, you know, is, and can read a lot better than William Carlos Williams and Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot because they were literally just looking at objects and being very horizontal. They weren't focusing on this vertical thinking. So... And I don't feel like an artist, a real artist, I don't want to, you know, it's kind of sketchy sometimes to define what a real artist is, but artists who are taking the work seriously and spending time alone and in solitude and really developing that, if you are doing that and you're not trying, you're not like hack writing your way up to the top and just getting really good at making stories and characters and plots, you are going to develop. And if you live a life, a spiritual life, no matter what your faith is, you will develop the symbolic, metaphorical, and subconscious connections that, and you know, a lot of authors do. A lot of authors on this list that we're going to see do, and a lot honestly don't. Um, so then, last but not least, they honor the creative muse. And what I mean by that is that they live out their creativity, that this author is that, that whatever they are doing, they are living and they are honoring it, and they are not degrading it. They are not selling out to these ideas in their personal life, in their writing. They follow threads and they refine those threads. And those threads are them. Those threads are a huge, beautiful expression of their soul instead of writing for, we, you know, other reasons. And they are very good at that. If, if, if you know, this creative muse is like a signal, they have the strongest Wi-Fi router, and then they are letting that flow, accepting it and putting on it onto the page and publishing it and not publishing anything less than something that honors that creative muse. So... Those are the three standards I think that I came up with. Pretty easy. They have a transcendent style genre and, you know, time and they transcend their time period and they look vertically instead of looking horizontally. They're looking um to rise above, you know, the people that came before them or also to praise them and pull from them and also in their own consciousness with contrast. They use dreams, symbolic thinking, metaphors, and the subconscious to di display their work through characters and through the plot and through the setting. And they also honor their creative muse. So the for list that we're going to look at is the 2021 Nobel Prize of Literature bookie odds, um, which is for betting. So you could bet this is what the bookies made the odds. And first of all, of course, the no the Nobel Prize in Literature is a joke because it is one very biased, as we've seen with all the awards, that have, because it's you know a Scandinavian, um, the you know the Nobel Prize. It comes a lot of Scandinavian judges, as you've seen. There there has been so many 
random Scandinavian author picks throughout the last, you know, however long. A lot of the great, a lot of great authors have been missed along the way. And now, you know, with they, you know, with diversity quotes and stuff, the whole, their whole um, merit as a, oh, uh, their whole, their whole merit as a group that gives award awards out to the people with the best writing merit is been has been diminished. But they have a pretty good list in terms of what the modern public consciousness is. So if I'm looking at the first, if we're looking at this first list of individuals and I'll pull, pull it up full screen. Do you guys see anybody that stands out? Who do you guys actually know? Let's just, let's start there. Because like I said, I, I've researched everyone on this list and read something from them. Who do you guys actually know here? Do you know number one, Andy Ernox? Ernox? And the person that won this, I don't think is even on this list. The, the person who won this, everybody, has sold only a couple thousand books in the English language. <laughs> I think, that, if I remember correctly. Um, that's a different story. So, who do you guys know? Uh, Mr. Wathiango. I've read uh, two books from him. I've, I've read books from Haruki Murakami, Ann Carson, Margaret Atwood, Don DeLillo, and Can Zhu down there, if that's how you say her name. Who have you read books by? And I, like I said, I've been analyzing everyone, and we can look at the next list too. So let's look at page number two. Who do you guys know here? Do you guys know who Edna O'Brien is? Ivan Vladislav? Maybe you guys know Carl Ove Nosgaard, but him being on this list, Carl Ove, is the biggest joke of all time. I don't even know how this guy is on this list when we see like the actual, when there's actual heavyweights out there in terms of writing and literary art. So, we have Millen Kundra, Stephen King, Salman Rushdie, Cormac McCarthy. All right, here is the list of people, everybody. So who do you guys think? Who do you guys think? Here's the list. What are your guys' thoughts? If maybe someone else, like I said, comment down below who you think the greatest living author is. But I think that it comes down to basically three people. And, you know, it is unfashionable maybe not to me because i don't care that all three of these guys i think are men they are all men right now um maybe even the top five but we'll we'll say the top three the first and the first two runners up are i think first of all is haruki mirakami right here coming in at a 10 to 1 odds i think that and we'll talk about that in a second i think haruki mirakami in second third then I think Don DeLillo, Don DeLillo in second in terms of a literary fiction author that meets all the standards we just talked about. Then last but not least on the second page, someone who will never win the Nobel Prize in literature because of, we'll talk about that in a second, on this page. And the winner, who I think the greatest living author is, everybody, here it is, Cormac McCarthy, everybody. Notable works, Sutri. Oh, there's only supposed to be two E's in there. Blood Meridian, All the Pretty Horses, The Crossing, Cities of the Plains, and No Country for Old Men. I think that Cormac McCarthy, by far, for anyone who has ever, like I said, tapped into something outside of the city, into nature and to their own consciousness and spirituality, there's no other choice. And first of all, okay, let's... This is why I think... He won in general before I even go to the standards. The reason why he is the best easily is he has walked the walk in terms of being an artist that he basically his whole life outside, you know, after he got out, he never, he went to college for a year or two, dropped out, worked some odd jobs. And basically he lived off of writing and he lived in shacks. His wife left him. His, his wife and his kids were starving as he was trying to make money being a writer. They were living in a shack in the middle of Tennessee. And all this time, he was reading and writing for 8 to 10 hours a day at least from things that he said before. And his interviews are very sporadic. Cormac McCarthy only has one interview out there on the screen, and that's with Oprah. And it's like five minutes, five or six minutes long. And he's barely given any print interviews either. So Cormac McCarthy is this very elusive figure in general and he has so he's not he doesn't spend any time on he so the other reason i think he is is because he never had to confront real media he isn't a fan of tv he isn't a fan of the internet he isn't a fan of technology in general he enjoys science and scientific technology and he has a, i think a hobby interest in that and like you know is very interested in that as like a personal pursuit but in terms of like technology in his life he doesn't live it from what he said. 
that writers should not do that. That writers should shut the computer down and focus on reading and writing. And that's all that they can do. And he's been doing this because he's, I think in his mid to late eighties. Now, if we, if I can look that he's been ch chugging along since the thirties. So since the thirties, we have a guy who dedicated his life. Okay. That's not enough though. There's a lot of authors who've done that, right? A lot of people out there have dedicated their life. Cormac McCarthy also dedicated himself to nature for a lot of his books. He not only lived in the places that he was writing about, but for instance, Blood Meridian, he spent years traveling on horseback and sleeping on the trail, like the trails and the areas that he was talking about. Wrap your head around that. Well, he was writing a book, writing the books that he was writing. He was living in the areas, not just um, like, oh, I live in, I write about New York City. I live in New York City. No, Cormac McCarthy is, you know, he's tra has transcended city stories and is out in nature and he is living in the nature and studying and spending years and not just years because a lot of authors and writers say they're spending years writing, right? They have this idea. And actually, if you look at the top three, Haruki Mirakami writes every single day from 4 a.m. to 12 p.m., 365 days a year. Don DeLillo, DeLillo, similar schedule. He writes from like seven or eight to two or three in the afternoon. Both of them actually are runners. They actually have the same routine. They basically work for about eight hours and then go for a big run and then read and hang out with their family for the rest of the rest of the night. So what separates Cormac McCarthy from all the other writers who just write is that he is the prodigal torchbearer of Herman Melville, of Faulkner, of Hemingway. And he has taken literally a quantum leap, like what we think has happened with technology, with writing, in his work, with his characters, from those guys. If you compare his work to Hemingway, Faulkner, Melville, you can feel it, you can see what he's doing, but he is feels like he's, you know, LSD'd it. That's how like different it is. He has expanded it and brought it into the modern consciousness. And he is the last person who will ever be able to do this because he is he did not get this was pre-technology. Almost all of his works were before, I mean, you know, before the 2000s. I think the last one was written maybe in 1994, 1995. So he wasn't exposed to any of this. And he had spent, you know, a good 60 years at that point practicing, practicing writing. And, you know, when you're in your 50s and 60s, when he wrote all of his best books, he had had decades of being the suffering artist, the artist who is writing because he knows that he is great. And he lived this out. He didn't, you know, this wasn't, this isn't a, a sad story. So let's check out some of his, some quotes from some of his books and then compare it to some of the, um, to things in the presentation and why, um, how he fits into the, the standardization and the rubric. Cause this is so important, everybody, that we have authors that are separate from society that have transcended society and are writing from a different point of view, from nature, from God, from all these different things, and then add an eloquent style in after, you know, from four, five, four decades of writing every single day for hours a day alone without influence, without influence from publishers and from people. And that's where I think Margaret Atwood and a lot of authors on this left, had, and her, even Haruki Murakami and Don DeLillo, if we look, and even Cormac McCarthy, if we, if we look at Cormac McCarthy's work post-technology, right, um, once technology hit, he did No Country for Old Men, but that was in the early 2000s, and I think he had probably been working on that before the, you know, 9-11 and technology really took over, and then if you look at The Road, his 2008 book, that's his worst book by far. The Road by Cormac McCarthy, hopefully you've made it this far so you don't read that one, is his worst book. Probably, I, for sure, of that era. You know, from any, any book from Blood Meridian to No Country for Old Men, The Road really is a step down from all of those. But it's still a lot better than a lot of dystopian novels, though. He does not... And if we look at Don DeLillo and Margaret Atwood and Haruki Murakami, they've been releasing flops for a couple of years now, for at least five or six years now. So having and, you know, being able to maintain artistic integrity over decades and produce very good works is important. And I think that's when you become too inundated with the world, which I think Don DeLillo and especially Margaret Atwood did, they, you lose some of, uh, some of that tenacity. So let us now hop into some quotes. So, the truth about the world, oops. the truth about the world, he said, is that anything is possible. 
Had you not seen it all from birth and thereby bled it of, it, bled it of its strangeness, it would appear to you for what it is, a hat trick in a medicine show, a fever dream, a trance be populate with chim chimeras having neither analog nor precedent, an itinerant, itinerant carnival, a migratory tent show whose ultimate destination after many a pitch and many a mudded field is unspeakable and climatious beyond reckoning. I mean, dude, look at the contrast and the depth and the layers in that sentence with that metaphor. With the subconscious, with symbols, you know, we're just reading one random paragraph from this guy. And then when you hear that he was living out there and take my word for it, if you haven't read Cormac McCarthy, the stories, the characters, they come alive. It's there. Everything you need is there. I mean, they were watching out there past men's knowing where stars are drowning and whales, whales ferry their vast souls through the black, dreamless, and seamless sea. The man who believes that the secrets of the world are forever hidden live in mystery and fear. Superstition will drag him down. The rain will erode the deeds of his life. But that man who sets himself the task of singling out the thread of order from the tapestry will by the decision alone have taken charge of the world, and it is only by taking such charge that he will effect a way to dictate the terms of his own fate. So this is really good, as you guys can see. I mean, wow. I mean, if we want to look at a couple more. Nor does God whisper through the trees. His voice is not to be mistaken. When men hear it, they fall to their knees and their souls are riven and they cry out to him. And there's no fear, but only wildness of heart that springs from such longing. I mean, everything in here is, he thought that he thought in the beauty of the world were hid a secret. He thought that the world's heart beat at some terrible cost and that the world's pain and its beauty moved in a relationship of a diverging equity and that in this headlong deficit, the blood of multitudes might ultimately be exacted for the vision of a single flower. I mean, are you kidding me, man? I mean, this is it. This, this is writing, like I said, from the old world, from something that a lot of us don't have anymore, where our prefrontal cortexes, our desires, our work ethic have been demolished, our idea of what art should be with postmodernism and all these different things has taken us further away from the hum human experience, even if our writing is really good. And that is an unfortunate thing. And we may never get that back. We may never have characters and people who are free of the constraints of society and influence and trying to be a writer now and having to market or get on Instagram and go on speaking tours, all that has an effect. And Cormac McCarthy did none of that ever. And, you know, I, like I said, I think the actions, you know, in retrospect have a lot to do with why his success and what he is doing. So let's look at the presentation and let's just go over a couple of the, the ideas that um, I laid out in the text or excuse me, in the stand, in the standardization. So he transcends style. Cormac McCarthy, for instance, doesn't use, let's, oops, doesn't use quotation marks. He believes that you don't need quotation marks if you have set up the dialogue in the correct way. We should know who is speaking. Why do you need quotation marks and dialogue tags? If there is a conversation happening, we should have be able by now to identify people's voices. That's a pretty crazy concept. His use, as we've seen, of this biblical voice, this Melvillian, this Falkyrian, this Hem Hem Hemingwayan voice that is elevated, but is more epic and it is in tune with nature and the coming world, the post-World War II isolated consciousness. That is what Cormac McCarthy is tuned, tapping into that a lot of these others didn't have the opportunity to. The self-isolated consciousness. But he has touched it pre-technology. If we look at Don DeLillo's best books, Haruki Murakami's best books. There were pre-technology. It's, it's crazy. It's really crazy. Like Don DeLillo, for instance, his you know, pre-Underworld books, you know, Underworld and all the books before that have a totally different feel than when technology kind of came into play. And, you know, if you look at his life when like kids and stuff kind of became a burden. Cormac McCarthy, because I think he only had one kid and three wives and was in and out, much like we talked about with Rilke yesterday, he had that artistic tenacity to not let people bring him down. It is very hard to maintain an eight to 10 hour a day schedule for decades, no matter who's in your life, no matter what's going on, if you have kids and a wife, there's everyone's going to want you to be doing something else. There's going to be a million fights, but if you are trying to be the best, if you are trying to you know transcend style, genre, time, and horizontal limitations, more so than the people of the past and stand on the shoulders of 
Melville, Hemingway, Faulkner for Cormac, then that means you have to work harder and be better than all of them combined. You cannot have, like Cormac said, he doesn't drink because writers shouldn't, being a good writer, you know, if you want to be really good, you can't drink. Well, that's a lot different than Faulkner and Hemingway. You know, I don't, uh, Melville was just more of a kind of a random recluse. I don't know what his relationship with alcohol was, but I mean, and you know, and that's what, if you look at the Melville McCarthy analysis, which is kind of like one of the big contrast is that Melville lived the life. Moby Dick, he was a whale fisherman. He lived on the boats and hunted whales and then wrote about it. A lot of people now write from these very odd perspectives and it's like they're flexing their writing ability, right? Like I can write from all these imaginative perspectives, but something is lost in translation when you aren't being honest, especially when that gets stretched too far. If you're going to do something like I said, if we look at Cormac McCarthy's only failed work is a dystopian novel because that got a little bit outside of at his wheelhouse. Even though it was the world, he had to now reconcile a whole new reality. And, you know, I think there was a lot of other failures that he uh, missed in that one. But so genre, if we look at like all these books, like what the hell is Blood Meridian? It is, one, it is like the best book of all time that was written in third, uh, third, third person uh, omnipotent. This weird, um, you know, biblical style like that you can't put that into a genre other than like literary fiction but it could be literary fiction it could also be environmental literature it could be a coming of age story it could be a western it could you know every single one of his, his books has and a lot of great books transcend their genre they also transcend their time when you read for instance his um the border trilogy the all the pretty horses the crossing and cities of the plains you don't know what time period it is. I remember reading it for the first time. I remember reading the whole series when I was like in high school and I was like, Oh shit. And, or the first two books maybe. And I didn't know that, like, I thought it was like the 1800s. And then suddenly I realized like, Oh my God, this is post world war two. People just still ride around on horses in Mexico still. Um, you know, this is still a thing. Like people live this life and don't have technology, don't have TVs, don't maybe even have electricity. And they, um, ride on horses everywhere. They will ride on horses for hundreds of miles. That's insane. You know, I didn't know that. I thought that by 1930, either you were just poor and immobile or you had a car. I forgot about the old horse thing. People still were doing that. You know, uh, today that is a little bit more ridiculous. I'm, that's bringing the memory of, uh, back to me of uh, the book Ceremony by Leslie Mark and Marmon Silco. And they talk about how the, the longest, uh, they're like, the, they take the longest donkey ride for alcohol. They like ride for, you know, hours to go to the local bar. And it's kind of this, she's kind of making, you know, playing on the native American trope of, you know, them getting drunk all the time. And they're, they, they, they care so much that they'll ride a donkey for, you know, five or six hours to go to the bar. <laughs> um, anyway, but you know, that's what I'm saying is like, there's this, these ideas and this time transcendence that happens in the book, especially with, you know, like I said, Leslie Marmon Leslie Silco Ceremony, that is one of the best books of all time also. And that one, you know, it's sad that she really didn't write more books or put that much effort into books again uh, to some of her other books, but that one transcended time. It was, you know, another post-World War II book, but you wouldn't really know. You wouldn't, you know, a lot of it took place without technology. And then the horizontal limitations. There's literally, I don't think in any of the books that Cormac McCarthy writes, any of this viewing it, him trying to change, change the direct world or talk about socioeconomic status or diversity or all these different things, but it happens organically. If you read the border trilogy, for instance, and since there's a ton of dialogue that is in Spanish it is a English written book and there's no translations in the back or anywhere. There's, you know, pages of just, um, conversations happening in Spanish because Cormac McCarthy has lived in, you know, lived in Texas and New Mexico and would ride across the border into Mexico on his horses for these books and, you know, learn to speak fluent Spanish. And he's not going to have a bunch of characters in Span in, you know, um, like most books you read, like there's, it's kind of weird. You think about it, like authentically, a lot of books that take place in foreign countries, everyone's speaking English, like an English art author is writing a book, let's say about characters in Southeast Asia and they're all speaking English. Well, okay, you're like, well, what about translation? But it's kind of weird that Cormac McCarthy, there is no translation for that dialogue. He said, we are keeping the Spanish dialogue in here. That's insane because that is real life. That is when you go to Mexico, everyone's going to be speaking Spanish to you. So small little decisions like these 
or why Cormac really shines in all these areas, how he can transcend style with his use of nature as a character and genre, this blowing, this Melvillian blowing up of consciousness, time and transcending his time period and the horizontal limitations that are happening. So let's check out the next second section. So symbolic, metaphorical, and subconscious connections. So all of Cormac's books, especially though from Blood Meridian to No Country for Old Men, have dream sequences. They have weird stories, for instance, where a character will be in the middle of the woods and meet a band of gypsies, and they'll tell him a symbolic story about a plane crash. And if you know how a plane crash and um, the character has this weird reaction to it, and you know, Cormac's books are very objective, but these subjective elements that he sprinkles in are like this really good form of magical realism. Unlike Murakami or other magical realism, it's all still an objective reality. But the stories and the symbols and the dreams all give room for ex explication. He isn't telling us. He isn't, you know, doing the social justice, you know, this is what you need to feel. This is what we were talking about. This is the cause that we are targeting. It is the Hemingway iceberg. It is the talking therapy, huge... Um, the talking therapy idea where we have so much that we can we can go through our own life and our own healing journey through talking about these books because there are so many different angles that you can take. The Cormac McCarthy literary criticism world is huge. Unlike any other, the ideas and the people and the dedication and the depth that they go to. And, you know, it's funny, though, you know, there is no Marxist or um, Foucaultian analysis most of the time of a uh, Cormac McCarthy work, which is great. They aren't being deconstructed. They don't get deconstructed by postmodernists. They are synergized and shown with some of the best elements of society through nature, through love, through the isolated um, coming of age story. You know, there is a ton of great books. There's one called Shreds of Matter, this really great book on um, literary criticism texts about Cormac McCarthy's works, and is one of the most mind blowing books I've ever read. And it was just talking about his books and the connections and how deep um, and their relation to nature. So being able to use symbolic, metaphorical, and subconscious connections really, like as we talked about earlier, give an eternal nature, some depth to a work. But those do not just come out of nowhere. You cannot fabricate this. You have to live this. You have to feel this. These come from the author's subconscious through time on the page, through living this life, through understanding and trusting in their work and in their art. Most authors today don't do that. And if they do, it's for one book. It's not through a string of books over a couple decades that are all landmark texts on their own. If we, like I said, if we look back at that list, all those authors are pretty good. Some of those authors who I didn't mention have a good book or two out there. But do they have five or six books that really capitalize on these concepts and really, like I said, keep building upon what they were doing before and the people the people whose shoulders they are standing upon because a lot of authors if i'm looking at like and you know a person who won the nobel peace prize or not peace prize nobel prize in literature a couple years ago kashiro ishiguro i'm looking at him and if we look at the if we look at this it's like kashiro ishiguro has a style of the unreliable narrator he's taken that to a level that no one has ever known before um, of genre, very transcendent of genres in that, and, you know, in time, you know, with dystopian and re like he has books from all eras, all places, and they have symbolic, metaphorical, and subconscious connections because of the aspect of the unreliable narrators. The only way we can feel and understand sometimes that these unreliable narrators is through the symbology that Ishiguro places inside the stories. And I actually didn't mention Ishiguro in that list, but I would probably put Ishiguro in the top five list too. He deserved that Nobel Prize in literature, but his work is more appealing. The Nobel, you know, the the people who vote on the Nobel Peace Prize do not want to give the award to a reclusive white American male writing about nature and connecting with nature and the end of journey of individuation and archetypes and the, you know and this is all like this elevated biblical and melvillian language they that serves no agenda that serves no quota that doesn't um and that's what's sad about all this and a lot of people will never read cormac mccarthy's work and it's they're not going to be told and it's like people need to if you can't understand and dive into some of these works that we've talked about isha guru leslie marvin silko cormac mccarthy haruki mirakami 
Margaret Atwood and Carson, you know, and a bunch of other people who are now dead. Why are you worried about causes? Why are you worried about trying to change the world and feel these things or getting into these weird diversity love stories? That is all good. And that's all good writing. I love stories like that. There's nothing wrong with that, but trying to ascend into high literary art. You, you can't stay down at that level. Authors are, have to pull themselves out of that. Like Haruki Mirakami does a great job of that. If you look at like Octavia Butler's book, Parable of the Sower, she does that. There is a lot of deep analysis and thinking in that. And that's why she, you know, pushed African-American science fiction to the next level because she did not sit and she did not get, she was not constrained. Like you read that book, that book was written in the nineties, I think, or early, early 2000s. 2000s it still stands as one of the best dystopian books out there today like authors tap need to be able to tap into this and we need to give them credit for that but in a world where book publishing companies are trying to push books for sales and they have programmed the reading base to want books that like push causes instead of symbolic metaphors and subconscious threads because people can't understand that it takes understand these threads it takes a certain level of literacy and life knowledge and being tuned into the artistic flow yourself to understand these things that you know these things that i've laid out here without that you will think it's just garbage woo woo boring and instead you'll revert to something easy something that tells you what to think we i don't want my art to tell me what to think i want it to Show me the way and then along the way, I can do crazy side quests and be expanding it and flowing with it the whole way. And I don't understand why you would ever release something that doesn't do that. Every single video on this channel, I'm trying to find an idea and expand it into something that's actionable and deep and add some symbol symbology and metaphors into that. Hopefully through my unconscious as I'm talking, these threads that I'm trying to find. Cormac McCarthy does a great job of that. And finally, he honors the creative muse. And we've kind of talked about this all already, but someone who lives the life, walks the walk, doesn't ca do cash grabs, doesn't do like his wife was one of his ex-wives back in the day when they were literally starving. They didn't have toothpaste. They didn't have food. They were living just like on elk meat and foraged, you know, vegetables. She'd be like, you know, they'd be getting authors. She'd be getting offers in the mail for thousands of dollars. And this was back in the day. And so I'm sure that was tens of thousands of dollars now to come speak at a writing conference or to do a workshop over the weekend at a writing conference. He said, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not, I'm a writer. I don't need like, I'm a writer. I write. I don't, I don't do workshops. I'm not going to appease to a bunch of people who can afford like People who can afford to come here and listen to me are probably just a bunch of yuppies. I'm not going to go. I don't, he obviously I'm like, you know, he didn't say this, but he probably said something like this. Why didn't he go? Cause that's not what he's here for. He's honoring that creative muse. A lot of us and a lot of artists now sell out. I mean, you know, I've seen it with so many different people. Like for instance, Neil Gaiman, one of my favorite authors, he's been AFK on the novel writing scene because he's been focused on turning a lot of it, adapting a lot of, a lot of his works to te to television. American Gods was basically a flop. That show has been canceled. Um, a lot of his other, other than like Stardust, a lot of his adaptations and his Good Omens, what he tried to do with Good Omens, and now with the, the Sandman's probably going to turn out really good. But everything he's done so far has resulted in, you know, I'm not trying to bag on the guy, um, but you know, he's got divorced. He has written nothing. He is an author. He is known as an author, not as a movie producer, not as any of these things, not as a celebrity, not as a talker, not as a creative writing teacher. He doesn't do those things. He is a writer. That is what he is best at. And he has aspired to that. Like it's, it's not like since 1995, he was teaching creative writing and doing this. Suddenly in 2010, he was like, oh, I can you know make a bunch of money from this. And that's not wrong. But if we are trying to identify the best authors out there and then analyze them and see why some rise above the others in terms of the language, and why some fall short, this is one of the reasons that they honor the creative muse. And, you know, Cormac McCarthy hanging out at the Santa Fe. So the, I think it's called the Santa Fe Scientific Institute or something. He hangs, he, he'll, he hangs out there and writes his novels. He, he will hang out there and write and read and hang out with scientists. He hates other writers. He likes talking to scientists because he loves that path of knowledge. He loves learning about physics and science and um, the evolution of those. It's insane. I mean, so it, I mean, what do you think would be more useful for a writer or a thinker going and hanging out on Hollywood sets or going on speaking tours or teaching creative writing to randos 
or pursuing something that you're really passionate about because it probably makes you a better person and a better thinker. That's what Cormac did, you know, did at the Santa Fe you know, Scientific Institute or whatever it's called. These types of things are important, like I said, in terms of longevity over decades, in terms of how a writer is going to turn out. If they lose the spark, if they lose the focus, if they're not around other smart people who are pushing them and not being yes men to them. Cormac McCarthy is the dumbest guy in that building because, I mean, he's going there that, to a place whose purpose is for scientific research, and he's not a scientist. He's really interested in science, so, but in biology and all these different things. But he's not a scientist. He's, like I said, probably the dumbest person there. But that's why he wants to be elevated. He doesn't have an ego. I mean, wouldn't that be, <laughs> it'd be kind of weird if you like, hang, like Haruki Murakami was coming, like really um, showing up every day and interested in like your martial arts club or your, you know, whatever it is. But you'd be like, wow, this guy's actually on the pursuit of knowledge. He's trying to learn and he's trying to be better. And he's having a beginner's mindset. So I think that's why Cormac McCarthy in the long run um, is the best, everybody. All these reasons I've laid out, let me know what you think. And if you say, let me know if you've read Cormac McCarthy too when you're commenting. If you say, no, I think it's blank, then after that say, I've never read Cormac McCarthy or I think it's blank because they are better than Cormac McCarthy as, you know, as an objective writer because of this and tell me why let me know why I, i'm interested to see what people's responses are because like i said i'm looking at that list and no one has the prolific writing stories um style than he does i i can't imagine anyone else out there who has spent more time producing great words and great sentences sentences than mccarthy so thank you guys for being here thank you guys for um walk and check out all these works all these works i've, I've put on the screen the reading order I would read, I would probably do The Crossing, Blood Meridian, All the Pretty Horses, Cities of the Plains, and then No Country for Old Men. The, the, all the Pretty Horses, The Crossing, and Cities of the Plains are a trilogy, but you can read one or two in whatever order you want. They are um, separate. The two protagonists then come together in, chapter, in book number three. So you can read those in whatever order you want. But I would probably read The Crossing first so you get the style. Or Blood Meridian, one or the other. Then read Blood Meridian because then you get it. That's like his magnanimous work. That's insane. And then, yeah, get through the trilogy. Then read No Country for Old Men. Or to start and then read Such Re Last. Or if you really like the book, No Country for the movie, No Country for Old Men, right? Just read that one. That one's really good. That really is like, it's way better than the movie. The movie won an Academy Award for Best Picture. But the book is even better. Like there's all these crazy dream sequences and um, weird synchronicities and the writing style. It's insane. It's really good. So I would go check that out. Thank you guys for being here and I will see you guys later.